the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, this morning reflected upon the fact that this is the 500th anniversary of the date in which Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg. This appears to be something of a puzzlement for the British Broadcasting Corporation. Why this would be an important event. But there were, of course, experts on hand to help to explain why this is an important event, why it is worthy of commemoration and reflection. If you ask people why the Reformation matters, it's really interesting the array of answers you will get. For instance, some people will say, well, it's, it's about a political impact. It's about the rise of the nation state. It's about the possibility of representative democracy. It's about an entire understanding that is integral to the modern age of what it means to be a citizen and what it means to be a human with human rights. That's a, that's a part of the, uh, of the impact of the Reformation. If the, if the world media will give any attention to the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, perhaps it is because of its political impact. Perhaps you can't explain the map of Europe. And, and you can't explain furthermore the map of the world as we know it without recourse to the Reformation. Maybe that's sufficient reason for commemorating the Reformation. Or some will argue it's, it's economic, it's an economic impact. And, and of course, this isn't particularly new. It can be traced back even beyond, say, Max Weber and Ernst Treltz, the famous proponents of the idea that what the Reformation brought about was a Protestant work ethic. That beginning in Wittenberg and even more accentuated by Geneva, the, the theology had an economic impact. An economic impact not only about the dignity of work, but about God's blessing being evident in the rewards of, of work. That led to the modern emergence of what we know as a market economy that, that led to capitalism. The argument is, it, without the Reformation, you could not have the, the use of capital. Without the Reformation, you could not have the rise of the middle class as we know it. Without the Reformation and its accompanying work ethic, there would be no modern economy as we know it. So perhaps that's justification for celebrating and remembering the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Then of course, the psychiatrists and the psychologists will enter the scene and they will say there's another reason why maybe the Reformation is, is actually important to us. And not just the Reformation in general terms, but Martin Luther specifically. Maybe Martin Luther is actually the prototype of the first truly modern man. Thomas Carlyle and others pointed in this way. Even Friedrich Nietzsche pointed to, to Luther. The, there's the modern age, the man who stands up at the Diet of Arms, and, and, and there he says, here I stand, that first person singular. Or, or the argument would be that modern individualism, as we know it, the, the modern idea of the, of the individual is the most important and basic unit of, of concern, politically, economically, sociologically. The, the idea of the self the projected self, standing on its own two feet. Maybe that's Luther, as Eric Erickson would later say, maybe Luther's the prototype for uh, the fact that inevitably uh, our psychological lives show up in our comprehensive lives, including in our theology. Maybe that's, uh, maybe that's the reason to commemorate the Reformation. Others will argue about the cultural impact beyond politics and economics. You, you, can't, you can't explain the world as we know it, certainly the Western world, w without looking to the impact of the Reformation in every dimension, including music, including art. Usually, by the way, those who point to the Reformation impact on art consider it a devastating impact, uh, simply because of the materiality of the theology of the, of the Roman Catholic Church that gave rise to a, a complete celebration of visual arts, and not only the visual, but other arts as well, but most particularly the visual arts. Uh, it was a, the church became a show place. The, it became an eye house. And Martin Luther would come along and say, the church is to be about preaching and it's to be a mouth house. It's to be about preaching the word. And the architecture, everything was impacted. If, if your main concern is art, the Reformation is devastating because you do not need nor even want art and sculpture in a mouth house, as Luther described the church, a place for preaching. But maybe nonetheless, whether you're talking about the rise or the fall, it's, uh, it's culture that we should talk about on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation.
Then there are those who say, no, here's the real impact of the Reformation. The Reformers surely did not intend this, but, uh, but nonetheless, the, the real impact of the Reformation is our modern secular age. Modern secular society is actually the inevitable result of the Reformation. Once the Reformation began and, and tore Christendom asunder, what, what, what once once the bonds between the altar and the throne, between the, uh, the, the church and the state were torn asunder, as inevitably happened in the aftermath of the Reformation, the door was actually opened not just for a division in Western Christendom, but the collapse of Christendom and the rise of secularism. In the last few years, there have been those who have argued this openly. And not only that, there were Roman Catholic apologists in the centuries long before the 20th century who warned of a similar kind of fate. And there are those who are saying that as we think about this 500th anniversary of the Reformation, what we really should think about is an open wound in Christianity. An open wound we call the Reformation. A wound because of the tear in the fabric, indeed even in the flesh of the church. Schism the tearing apart of Christendom, the separation of Protestantism and Catholicism as two rival churches, a slander against the unity to which Christ called His church. All of this is a part of the conversation. All of this is a part of the chatter. The secular world's trying to figure out why they should say anything on the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. Several of us have been in Germany uh, because of this 500th anniversary, and, and I was several times in Wittenberg, and as October approached, as I was there in different times of the year, it was very interesting to see that for the city of Wittenberg, which is undoubtedly instilled with an incredible sense of history, they also saw an economic opportunity. And, and in secular Europe, there were teenagers wearing Here I Stand socks. And, uh, and eating Luther cookies, and, and there were Luther puppets, and uh, we were in a shop, and Mary happened to point out Luther and Katie hand puppets that you could buy. I don't know what Luther would say about this. I don't know what Katie would say about this. What Luther had to say would be more colorful, I'm sure, than what Katie would have to say. But, but nonetheless, in Wittenberg, it was clear Luther was on everything. There, here he stood just about everywhere. One of the interesting things is that there in Wittenberg, even though so many people seem to have so little connection in that part of Germany, now almost as secular as the rest of Germany, people seem to have very little connection to Luther's theology. But the interesting thing is they could not tell his story without it. So it's interesting that even the secular state licensed guides, they would have to get to virtually everything Luther fundamentally believed in order to explain the why of how all of this had happened. But for the world around us, it's, it's like they will talk about theology because they have to, because you can't explain Luther otherwise. But in terms of why the Reformation is really important, we'll forget the theology and just look at the politics, the economics, the cultural impact, and, and judge it to be positive or negative, happy or sad, depending upon your perspective. But at any point, as one broadcaster was making clear just this morning, in, in any event, it was evidently important. Well, in any event, it was. The interesting thing, of course, is that it must not have appeared to have been important at the time. When Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses to the castle church door, he wasn't doing anything remarkable at all. That was actually the way a German professor would begin an academic disputation, would announce an argument, and would invite others into the argument. In this case, Martin Luther's 95 theses were, were 95 statements, and most of them follow rather sequentially as you look through it. it uh, it's an argument, a rolling argument, you might say, with 95 points. And, and, and that argument was a call for reform. It was addressed to the church, addressed to the Archbishop of Mainz in particular, but ultimately addressed to the Pope. And, and Luther, as you well know, outraged by the sale of indulgences. And not only that, but by the fact that the sale of indulgences drew greater and greater attention by the greater and greater corruption involved to the corruption of the theology underneath the practice. 
So many people are saying, just in the course of these days, Luther was offended by certain practices in the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope, Pope Francis, when he went to Lund last year on the 499th anniversary of the Reformation. And uh, so there you had basically a liberal Roman Catholic speaking to liberal Lutherans. What, what he said was, we now know that Luther had many important points and he wanted to reform the church of certain practices. The interesting thing is, is that if you actually read all 95 of the 95 theses, you'll come to understand that by October the 31st of 1517, Luther understands that it's not just the practices, it's the theology behind the practices. Luther begins in that very first thesis, not just with an indictment of the practice of the sale of indulgences, but rather with the fact that Christ calls His church to repentance for the entirety of life, not to a sacrament of penance. For Luther, it was a bit like unpeeling an onion. And, and on the outer edge of the onion, in, in terms of the 95 Theses, are the practices of the church, the corrupt practices of the church, the sale of indulgences. But what was behind that was Luther's dawning realization as a professor of Bible that this is incompatible with Scripture. That actually Scripture never calls anyone to penance, but rather to repentance. And not repentance just as one act, but rather a life of repentance. The Christian's life, Luther came to understand, is of constant repentance and constant need for the forgiveness of sin and constant assurance of the provision of forgiveness and the grace and mercy of God in Christ. Thus, Luther's revulsion was, was not just towards certain practices, although the practices, quite frankly, were the catalyst, they were, they, were, they were the fuse that led to his theological consideration and to his turn to Scripture as a professor of Bible. But it was also the corruption of the practices that explained why so many of the German princes and the German nobility were quite open to a criticism of the church for these practices. It's also clear they weren't quite as open to a, a theological challenge to the church. But God used that context and God used that event 500 years ago on this date. Now, we have to say 500 years ago on this date rather than 500 years ago on this day. Why? Because the calendar's moved a bit in the last 500 years. I'm not going to stake my life on exactly which day is 500 days from October 31, 1517, but I will stake the day. Now, stand on the date. October the 31st. Here we are in 2017. I'm 58 years old. And that's just a bulletin in case anyone's curious. <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm 58 years old. I've, uh, I've celebrated a few birthdays. And I've been around for a few anniversaries. I can remember the 200th anniversary of the United States, the American Bicentennial. I was uh, 16, a high school student. And uh, that was a very big deal. To a 16-year-old, the idea that a country could be 200 years old, that was a pretty big deal. Of course, America is just a wink in world history, but to a 16-year-old, it was a big wink. And, uh, and not only that, it was pretty clear that something important happened 200 years previously. The, the founding of the United States of America, the, the Declaration of Independence, a, a Declaration of Truths that that established the very basis of a, a new national identity, a, a truth claim that was announced in something even entitled a Declaration of Independence, the original copy of which you can find in the National Archives under atomic bomb-proof glass. Let's not test that theory. Uh, where th nonetheless, you can look at it with your eyes, the documentary evidence of what those founders believed and why it led them to lead what became a revolution and establish what became a nation. 200 years seemed impossibly old. Well, here we are talking about a 500th anniversary. And in order to place that in history, let's just remind ourselves that that's about one quarter of all of Christian history. So, if we're going back to Jesus and to the apostles, and, and we're coming forward to the present time, roughly one quarter of that time is in the space we commemorate after the Reformation. Now, of course, that implies something else, and, and that is that we had 15 centuries before that. Huge questions 
Huge questions of continuity and discontinuity. Huge questions of doctrinal content and of spiritual practice. Huge questions about ecclesial corruption and, and frankly, the loss of the gospel in the ears of Christ's people. All that brings us to October 31, 1517. Did Luther intend to start a Reformation? Well, what's clear is he began with a, a very firm hope and determination to challenge the Pope to reform the church. It, it's not at all clear that in 1517, Martin Luther intended to establish anything that would later be known as Lutheran or even as Protestant. But that did happen. And it happened because the logic found in those 95 theses, that logic worked its way out. It worked its way out because it was found in Scripture. It was a scriptural impulse that led Martin Luther to post those theses. It was a scriptural impulse that led him to develop very quickly, under fire, under threat of his life, the Reformation theology that we now so well know. So Martin Luther goes from 1517 to, to planting the the seed for a reform of the church, he, at least it is believed, and there's good evidence to believe, thought that when the Roman Catholic magisterium, and in particular the Pope in Rome, heard his logic and understood the excesses and corruption, the Pope would, would reform the church. One of the things we have to realize is that there was near universal revulsion at the corruption of medieval Catholicism. The Council of Constance had been called a century earlier in order to address corruption in the church. The corruption in the church was so grotesque, I don't even have time to summarize it. Let's just say that you had rival popes at one point. You had, you had Medici and Borgia popes, and if you know anything about history, that's, that's like the worst of Europe in two houses, both of them represented in the papacy. You had popes with grandchildren, and you had popes who made nephews cardinals. You had popes who sold things openly, and you had popes that it turned out, which Luther, we now believe, did not know. The pope who had a personal interest in Tetzel selling those indulgences in such a way, he was not very really open to reform. That was clear. But what did begin with Luther, even if he did believe that the pope would hear him and reform the church, what did become in increasingly clear step by step, very quickly in the life of Luther, is that he was drawn into the logic of what we now know as the Reformation. By the time you get to the Leipzig dis disputation, it's, it's very clear there, there in Leipzig, Luther is moving towards sola scriptura. Why? Because it's Scripture that brought him to the concern. It's Scripture that, that revealed to him repentance rather than penance. It was Scripture that had earlier revealed to him what we now know as justification by faith, but not only that, justification by faith alone. It was the Scripture that led him increasingly to understand not only that popes and councils may err, but that popes and councils have erred, and that right now popes and councils are erring, corrected only by the Word of God. Then there were other events, of course, the Heidelberg Disputation, where, where Luther is drawn deeper and deeper into the logic of justification by faith alone. When, when, when in the Leipzig Disputation he has to make his case, he ends up on the authority of Scripture alone, not necessarily because he went into this intending to find himself there, but because the only authority, it turned out, he had to claim was the authority of God's written Word. There he stood. Doctrinally, theologically, logically, all of this unfolded. Why does the Reformation matter? One of the temptations at a conference like this is that, uh, that we'll revel in the history. And, and by the way, that's a temptation we should give ourselves to, to some extent. We, 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 we should revel in the history. There, there, there's something glorious about this. It's important that we recognize that the Christian church, like the Christian scriptures, are embedded in space and time and history. That's really important. That's a part of the dignity of the Christian faith. It is making historical claims, as the scripture makes clearly historical claims. Our understanding of the church and its history, we make clear historical claims. Not only the fact that events happen, but that events mean something. 
and that we find ourselves of necessity tracing these questions because we want to make certain that we stand in the right line of preaching, that we stand in the right line of teaching, that we stand in the right line of faithfulness. So we go through the twists and turns in the convoluted caverns of church history, not just out of some kind of antiquarian interest, but because we recognize that what is hanging in the balance is whether or not the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached now, whether or not God's people hear God's Word now. And that's over against the frightening understanding that for centuries the gospel was obscured. And the Bible was, it is no exaggeration, kept from Christ's people. The stakes cannot be higher. I want to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, just two verses. Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes in verse 16 and verse 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, to remember Luther is to remember a man whose biography and history is amazingly well known to us. Why? Why, why is Luther so accessible to us? Why, why does Luther appear on the scene of church history so real to us? Why, why do we feel an intimacy with Luther that we might not feel with other characters of, of church history? I think a part of the reason is, is because we have more or less the whole Luther. We have, we have Luther in his guarded and in his ever more often unguarded moments. We have Luther in the white hot of controversy, and, 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 and we have Luther in his home. We have, we have Luther and Katie in their home together establishing the Protestant family. We, we, we have Luther's personal life. We have Luther's arguments. We have, we have Luther the writer, unprecedented in Western history in terms of at least two very important facts just in the history of printing and publishing. This was a man whose words comprised one-third of all of the literature printed in German for three centuries. It has an amazing impact. Even one, one Historian of printing just in the last few days, and again, in the national media, international conversation, trying to say why the Reformation is important, he said the printing press predated Luther, but publishing didn't. Very interesting. The printing press, the Gutenberg press, predated Luther, but publishing didn't. Publishing as a movement, publishing as an enterprise, it all really came out of Luther. It's one of the reasons we know Luther is because we have so much of his writings. We have his tracks, tracks that filled it, as we know, tracks that he even personally designed because he understood that how someone saw a text would imply something about how someone would read a text. And then, of course, we understand that our ability to converse with Luther is also in part because Luther basically invented the modern German language as we know it. It, it was said very candidly in Germany that up until Luther's translation of the New Testament and the, the publishing of Luther's writings, you would need a translator every 50 kilometers in Germany. The dialects were so diverse, so difficult. It is interesting, of course, that the printers and the publishers and the histories of text look to Luther in language. We look to Luther as the translator of Scripture. We, we go to the Wartburg Castle where Luther, there under the protective custody of, of the elector, is, uh, is actually giving himself to the translation of Scripture. We also have to press back to that and understand that as a professor of Bible, Luther in Wittenberg, long before he came to the Wartburg and long before he translated the New Testament, he had already begun translating every day's text for the lesson into German. Now, that might sound to be completely commonsensical. That was not done. It was simply not done. But Luther did it. 
And, and when Luther did things like this, people took note. Indeed, they took notes. They, they wrote down what he said. They, they, they understood what they were hearing was something they'd never heard before. By the way, here's just a little fact for us to keep in consideration. Uh, Luther basically in Wittenberg, uh, for the years in which he arrived in the, the last of the first decade of the, of the 16th century, Martin Luther began to teach the Bible, not only in terms of translating most importantly from the Greek and the New Testament, but he also taught some from the Old Testament, translating from the Hebrew. But in every case, he translated it into German in order to teach those preachers how to teach and preach the Bible in the language of the people. Now, wh why do I mention that here? It is because the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary was established in 1859, okay? Do the math. 1517, take it as a date. 1859. This institution was the very first institution to include four credit classes in the English Bible for the preparation of preachers, a move that was widely criticized at the time. John R. Sampy, president, the fifth president of this institution, pointed out, he said, well, those who were the critics would have to admit that not one of the 12 apostles could have gained entry to any of their seminaries in the United States. Nor would they have been comprehensible to a congregation once they had graduated. Just a reminder of the fact that there's an unfolding logic of the Reformation. But the point is we know Luther because you can't explain so much of the world. We know it certainly within evangelical Christianity. We can't explain this without Luther. And, and we're drawn to Luther because Luther documented his own life. He, he, he lived it out. In fact, he tortured people with it. You, know, you, you come to know that when Luther had a problem, everybody had a problem. <laughs> and, and, and Luther had huge problems. L Luther became, as you know, a monk because in the middle of a thunderstorm, he had made the pledge to St. Anne, as he was there at Erfurt, to the patron saint that if he survived, he would become a monk. Now, vows like this were customarily made and then customarily forgotten. Martin Luther was not the kind to forget a vow. He, he made the vow. He, uh, he told his father he was not going into law, devastating his father's hopes, not only because he wasn't going into the law in terms of the money, but rather going into theology where there would be no money. But even more importantly for Hans Luther, the bigger issue was he was not going to be a grandfather uh, because that was also a not incidental byproduct of one son becoming a monk. And then we see there in the Augustinian monastery, we see Luther trying so hard to be a monk. We see the Luther who said, if any monk could have been saved by his monkery, it was I. <laughs> this was a monk desperately aware of his sin. Why? Because even as Martin Luther had not seen an entire Bible until he arrived at Erfurt as a university student, and even as Luther, when he graduated from the university, didn't know how many books were in the Bible, that, that's how little the Bible was in the curriculum, he had been reading the Scriptures. And he'd been hearing the Scriptures in the cycle of prayers of the orations of the monks. Luther was desperately afraid of hell. And Luther understood himself to be tormented by the devil, and he was. Luther experienced what he described as his unfechtigen, these fits that drove him to, to, to despair, so much so that it's probably not an exaggeration to believe that this was very near suicidal. He speaks of throwing himself off of furniture onto the stone floor tried to do anything by the abuse of his body to somehow purge himself. And these on again, he despaired that he could ever, to use his own language, find a gracious God. How could he find a gracious God? The, the, the God that he heard in the Mass was not a gracious God. And indeed, Luther went so far as to say that the, the God he found in the Scripture he knew was not a gracious God. He, he, he read the Scripture and he saw God's justice and God's righteousness. He, he, he saw Isaiah 6 and came to understand that holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The, the whole earth is filled with His glory. L Luther came to understand two simultaneous truths that were beyond refutation. And the first was the holiness of God, the righteous God. 
the just God. And, and, and then his own sinfulness. And this is where Luther really started to drive everyone in the monastery mad because everyone admitted they were still steeped in an official theology that was Augustinian, even though the church had increasingly embraced a semi-Pelagian heresy. Nonetheless, they, they still had the vestiges of, of the knowledge that there was sin. The entire structure of life was in order to, to prevent sin and, and in a cycle of monkish preoccupation to keep them away from sin. But that was never totally possible, so they had a confessor to whom every monk would go. And, and of course, you well know that Luther's confessor was an older priest named Johannes von Staupitz. It's a wonderful name, good name, von Staupitz. And von Staupitz, it turns out, was a very kind man. And uh, not only that, uh, von Staupitz was in his own way concerned for the reformation of the of the church, at least for the reform of, of, of certain practices, including monastic practices, the practices of their own order. And, uh, and Luther, he saw in Luther enormous hope and enormous promise, but he also saw in Luther a pest because Luther would come and confess his sins and he, he would confess them over and over again. Luther's problem was that he kept digging a hole. And, and, and I think every one of us, if we understand sin and we understand the gospel, but we can understand the hole that Luther was digging. And, and the hole was this. He understood himself to be a sinner, digging a hole towards hell. And, and he understood that the rightful response of the sinner is to confess those sins and, of course, to go through the, the entire sacrament the, 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 uh, of penance and, and then of absolution and, and, and then the entire sacramental system of the church. But the problem is Luther sees his hole getting deeper and the sacramental system failing to give him any assurance whatsoever that he could be finally in a state of grace. Luther's desperately afraid of dying. So you've heard me talk about this before, but I had the opportunity as a young theologian to be with one of the great Reformation historians. His name was Heiko Obermann. And uh, he had recently written a great book on Luther, a very important book on Luther, entitled Luther, Man Between God and the Devil. And uh, he, was, he was seeking to show Luther as you have to understand Luther and his theology in a context of continual spiritual warfare, as Luther saw himself as, uh, as hanging between God and the devil, especially in the period that we're speaking of as, uh, in, in the years before what we know as the Reformation. But Heiko Obermann made the point to, to those of us, we were all young. He said, none of you can understand Luther because you're too healthy. And because you live in the age of antibiotics and anesthesia and vaccinations, he said, for Luther, death was a, a haunting daily reality. In the medieval world, infant mortality approached 80% in certain years. And, uh, and uh, that meant that children died before the age of, of 18. So very few would actually often make it into adulthood. And, and, and they didn't have a even a clue of germ theory. They didn't even have a clue how death might come or what certain illnesses were. They didn't have the ability to detect tumors. They didn't have the ability to understand communicable diseases. You know, you could be healthy in the morning and die at two in the afternoon. And, and Luther, very much aware of the nearness of his death, was deathly afraid that he would go to hell. He, he lost confidence in the sacramental system of the church because he saw himself as a vessel unable to hold on to or to contain any of the promises of grace and mercy that came to him through the sacramental system. And furthermore, he kept digging the hole even deeper in his confession of sin because he came to understand that even his repentance or his confession of sin was faulty. For, for understand Luther's logic, Let us, uh, I don't know what Luther might have done in a monastery. Let's just say in terms of headline sins, there probably wasn't much occasion for it. You know, he might have coveted a brother's porridge or, you know, who, who knows? But, but here's the problem. Here, here's the problem. Luther understands that he has sinned. And, and he understands that, that this sin requires penance. But the problem is, even as he confesses it, Luther, who is very aware of the inner Luther, in a way 
Many medieval persons clearly were not. You, you got Luther having an internal conversation with himself. He understands that he's not even sure that he is confessing his sin for a holy reason. So even his confession of sin is tainted by the fact that he just wants to get rid of this problem and he's not sure that his heart is adequately broken by the infinite assault he has made upon the holiness of God. And then he's certain that he can't even hold this in his consciousness. He, he can't because he gets hungry. And, and, and because he, 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 he I don't know, it, it's the Christian's ADHD. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. There's a butterfly. Uh, you know, we, we, can't, we can't keep our own consciousness. We, can't, we cannot even maintain our, our intellectual intensity when we're trying to do that. You know what it's like. You're right in the middle of what should be the holiest moment, and the person next to you, his stomach growls. <laughs> and that's what you hear. And you hear the pews creak. And, and you hear this. And then you think, I've got a Twitter feed waiting for me <laughs> after this service. We can't even maintain our, our consciousness, our attentiveness. Luther's hole got deeper and deeper and deeper. He found no hope. And, and this was not just a matter of intellectual perplexity for him. It was a matter of life and death. These unfectugen, these fits. So Luther, Luther found himself in what we call the tower experience, almost impossible to date, but almost surely before 1517, if not that experience, then clearly Luther's dawning realization of justification by faith alone. Luther would later point to this very text, in particular Romans chapter 1 verse 17, for in it the gospel, of which Paul is not ashamed, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Luther would later call justification by faith alone Justificatio est articula stantis est cadentis ecclesia. It is the article by which the church stands or falls. We're not sure Luther used that entirely specific Latin line, but it became the line associated with Luther's argument. Justification is the article by which the church stands or falls. We do know this. Luther said, in his own words, if the article of justification stands, the church stands. If this article collapses, the church collapses. I've tried to make the point over and over again that the issue that brought about the Reformation and brought about the Reformation churches was the word only. It's sola. You can find justification by faith in the church fathers. You can find justification by faith in some of the affirmations of the medieval Roman Catholic Church. By the way, very interestingly, Tony Lane points out that in terms of trying to evaluate Catholic, whether medieval or modern understandings of justification, the interesting thing is to note that it's not so much that Catholics say the wrong things as nothing at all. There's a basic disinterest in justification. The late Cardinal Avery Dulles here in the United States, in, in responding to that kind of argument said, it is true that Catholic theologians generally turn to justification only when engaged in debate or dialogue with Protestants. It's just not a preoccupation. It's not, it's not a concern. With a sacramental system, justification itself just is, is eclipsed. But nonetheless, you can find vestiges of justification by faith. You can find grace, undoubtedly. You can find Christ, unquestionably. And you can find Scripture. The problem is the word alone. I can still remember where I was when I first read what Erasmus said about Luther. When he said that the problem with Luther is that he's given to hyperbole. He called Luther Dr. Hyperbolicus. I love that. I, I wouldn't mind that on my tombstone. 
Dr. Hyperbolicus. Why? Because he said the problem with Luther is he turns every argument into a hyperbole. It's all right to say justification by faith. It's hyperbole to say justification by faith alone. It, it's fine to talk about grace, but it's hyperbole to say by grace alone. Of course, Christ. But Christ's righteousness alone? Alone? No righteousness of our own? That's hyperbole in Scripture. Of course, it was Erasmus who had given himself to the translation of the, of the New Testament, and in particular as to a new edition of the Greek New Testament. And, and he had given himself to the, the newly reinvigorated study of Scripture. Scripture, yes, but Scripture alone, hyperbole. Dr. Hyperbolicus. But for Luther, it wasn't just a matter of how much a doctrine should be emphasized. It was a question as to whether or not he could ever be at peace with God. He could ever find a righteous God who was simultaneously a gracious God. And he found that gracious God in this text of Scripture. The righteous shall live by faith. For Luther, this was not just a great theological turn. It wasn't just the, the moment the light bulb went on. It, it wasn't just the beginning of some kind of new trajectory of thought. For Luther, this was, as he said, the windows of heaven opening to him where they had been closed for all of his life. He saw salvation. He found grace, the gospel. I began by talking about the controversy about why the Reformation matters, but I, I want to end by turning very quickly to another question. Was the Reformation a failure? Peter Leithart wrote an essay just the last few days, got a lot of headlines. It was published at Fox News. They interrupted other preoccupations to uh, look at the Reformation, albeit briefly. The headline of the article, The Reformation Led by Luther Failed. Well, okay. People started sending it to me, uh, baiting a dog. Uh, they, they went, send it to me. Some, some would send it with, will you please say something about this? Others simply sent it without any words, sickum being implied. <laughs> and uh, so here it is. Here's, a, here's the argument carried by Fox News that uh, the Reformation led by Luther failed. Um, Peter Leithart argues that the Reformation failed because it led to a divided Christendom. And uh, it, 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 as he said, led to a de-Christianized Europe. He says that the Reformers' great hope was to unite Christendom and to reinvigorate Christendom. And uh, clearly that has failed. He said this, despite their achievements, the Reformers failed. The gospel took hold in some pockets, but it didn't reform the whole church or re-Christianize Europe. The Reformation failed because it fragmented the Western church. Protestants were forced out of the Catholic church, and soon Protestants began squabbling amongst themselves. Before Luther, the Western church wasn't perfectly calm, would have been an understatement, but as Reformation historian Lee Palmer Wandel has shown, the Reformation produced deeper and more lasting divisions. If you needed to cite an historian for that, okay, I'm moving on. Um, anyway, by the end of his article, he says, the Reformers denied that the word Catholic, which means universal, was equivalent to Roman. The church is Catholic because in all places and times, there's only one church. Yes, the Reformers believe that, so do I. Uh, he cites John Calvin as uh, teaching in his catechism, as there is but one head of the faithful, so they ought all to be united in one body. Well, yes. And by the way, not only ought to, but are. It is known as the church. Well, the whole point here is that the reformers failed because they didn't re-Christianize Europe and because, and his argument goes on, uh, there is division in Christendom. In an earlier essay, he said that Evangelicals should look to the Church of Rome and obviously see a, uh, a vessel of hundreds of millions of followers of Jesus. Oh, well, here's the point. And I realize that as time is running out, I've got to speak clearly and concisely. The Reformers did not split the church. The Reformers sought 
to find and to establish and to form the church for whom Christ had died. When they spoke of the marks of the church, the first mark was the preaching of the gospel and understood it was a positive and a negative mark where the gospel is preached, the gospel, this gospel, justification by faith alone, the, the, the gospel that saved Luther's life and saved him for eternity. This, this gospel, where this gospel is preached, there is a church. Where this gospel is not preached, there is no church. That, that's the issue. There is no church. This is not name calling. It's, it's gospel fidelity. They, they didn't split the church. And, and by the way, the, the, the supposed disunity of Protestantism, let me tell you, the only disunity that, that should concern us is the fact that Luther began an argument 500 years ago on this date, and that argument continues to work its way out. And those who stand in the gospel together, this gospel, the gospel together. We are in the same church. We, we may not be in the same congregations, and, and we may be denominated according to different denominations, but we stand together in the gospel, and we are confident of the fact that we are part of one great church because it's Christ's church. It's the church of which Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do we seek for a greater unity? Yes, we want to see a more visible unity. And, and what does that mean? It means that we believe that will come only by the preaching of the Word of God, full confidence in the Word of God, the norming influence of the Word of God, and the preaching of the gospel together. Was the Reformation a failure? Well, let me just answer it very quickly this way. The Reformation was not only not a failure. The Reformation, I must say, in my own sense of indebtedness and thankfulness to God, explains how I heard the gospel. And wherever the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, the Reformation doesn't fail. The success isn't the right word. The, the grace of God, the faithfulness of God to His church that we see in the Reformation and we celebrate today, it's to be most manifestly celebrated in the fact that the gospel is preached today. Where the gospel isn't preached, there is no church. Where the gospel is preached, Jesus saves. 500 years ago, something happened. Luther took a stand and began an argument. 500 years later, now is the time for each of us to take our stand and for all of us together to say, here we stand.